want to look at. Okay, now <laughs> we're being live streamed. Got it. We're live. I love Facebook. Live on Facebook. All right. Okay, well, I'm live here with uh, Dan and Jeremy Kubert. Is that how you pronounce it? Well, it's actually Cubert, but we, we answer to lots of things. Okay. Kubert's <laughs> uh, probably the most frequent uh, pronunciation. It okay, doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, well it's like, well, like the, uh, the late night show host, uh, Stephen Colbert, it's like people call him Colbert. So it's like, you gotta, it just depends on, you know, if you want it to be fancy, you can say it's nice. <laughs> I think we, it wasn't so much that we wanted to be fancy. It just, it needed to be different at the time, which was right. 105 years ago. So. <laughs> you look good for a hundred years. <laughs> yes, I know. It's the preservatives in the food. <laughs> Keeps me right. young. Well, like I, I, I mentioned to uh, Jeremy, is like, I found out about Secret Martyrs Club through Mark McRae. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he told me, he says, I think you can, you'd really like this, these guys' music. And I sing on some songs. Uh, when I heard that, I was like, going, wow, this, I said, you, you are, I wrote, wrote him back. I said, you're right. I really do like this stuff. I mean, this, it's right up my alley of how I like Trog to sound, um, where it's got, you know, complex music going on, but, but very melodic and um, and kind of the, the way some of the songs are kind of bordering on the, I want to say the haunting kind of a sound, you know, it's like, and which I'm sure it has to do with the, the title Secret Martyrs Club, you know, it's kind of have a little darkness to Actually, there's a lot of darkness to it, um, uh, but uh, it needed to be done. So, you know, it got done. Uh, I, Jeremy writes a ton of material, like every day there's something new. Uh, I hope you don't mind me talking about you. No, um, but, but uh, sometimes it'll be stuff that's very specific. Uh, the, the the subject matter is very specific, and uh, a lot of times it's it's the stuff that Jeremy does that has vocals on it that I get involved with. Uh, but you know he's he cranks out tunes all the time. It's just that not all of them fall into a vein of something I would be producing. Right. Well, no one wants to let me near a microphone, so. Um for singing uh, purposes, that is. So uh, yeah, I definitely, um, well, all of this is pretty much you could blame on Dan because he got me into Prague uh, when I was 10. You know, before that I was listening to AM radio and then uh, he uh, got, I think it was three albums that he got for his bar mitzvah that I got really into. And one was Zappa, one was uh, ELP. Uh, can't remember that. No, it might have been Mahavishnu. It might have been the third one. So uh, you can pretty much blame him for everything. Um, but this project, yeah, but then, um, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say. Then he, he took it and he ran with it, <laughs> and and while he went in a strictly prog direction, uh, I started to get interested in what makes a pop tune work. So we kind of diverged a little bit. But we still come together on on some things, sure. Yeah, yeah. But this project, is, as Dan said, was very specific, and uh, I view it as a therapy session to some extent, uh, and a reaction to the election uh, in 2016. And um, I'd say 99% of everything I've ever done has never really been political, and uh, this does fall into a very specific. Uh, political category. Um, and so I, you know, we talked about doing this project with, with a theme. Now, 
Uh, I mentioned that I don't sing. Um, Dan does some background vocals, but he's not a lead singer. So that always leaves us in the position of trying to find people who can sing. And um, we have a, a mutual friend who I was talking to about this. And he said, well, you need to talk to my friend, Mark. Uh, this would be right up his alley. Um, and uh, he put us in touch and uh, we started working on the first piece, uh, Everything Will Be Fine. Uh, and, you know, just went through that, that whole process. And, you know, he's a phenomenal vocalist and really nice guy. So it was, uh, it was easy doing, but uh, the reality is Dan did all the production. I mean, this is a, a project where I, I wrote some of the pieces, uh, other pieces I added parts to, but I was purely, uh, you know, a musician. And, and that uh, first piece I wrote at the piano, which is something I don't do a lot these days. A lot of times I write sitting at the computer um, playing various instruments. Uh, my joke about my guitar playing is that I'm a fantastic guitar player four bars at a time. Um, but for, for this kind of project, I actually sat down at the piano and wrote the piece, wrote the lyrics before I even went near the computer. I sent Dan the piano track and he uh, ran with it. All the, um, almost all the other instruments are him uh, and the production. And then he went back and forth with Mark and who had some vocal ideas. So I don't know, Dan might have yeah, I mean, the, thoughts on that. We got really lucky where uh, the vocalists that we're fortunate enough to work with, or pretty much everyone we're fortunate to work with. Uh, I When I send something to them, it doesn't need to be laid out in advance about how to do this or how to do that. There might be some general instruction, but you know, a guy like Mark or a guy like Robin or John or any of the people we use, they'll come back with stuff that we weren't even expecting. And sometimes it needs to be massaged a little into place, uh, but it's like getting a present really when the files come in and there's more than we imagined. And it's, do you know, the harmonies are, are going in directions that I didn't think of. Uh, so it's cool to get stuff in from from these great musicians, you know, who are here and and uh, in England, and uh, I think that's about it right now. I mean, there's some other folks, but uh, uh, mostly it's here in England. Right. Yeah. Um, like I said, when Mark told me about this, uh, I and he sent me the the files for it, and I listened to it. I listened to it again, and then uh, then I put it on my uh, one of these things, put it in my car, so I listened to it there. And I was like, you know, I kept on listening to it over and over, and I was like, going, this is honestly, this is something. Um, if anything, in my opinion, something very perfect. Just uh, I can hit, you know. It's it's timeless for me, you know, because it, it has, you know, with Mark, it has that that pop sensibilities because of his voice, and then the, then with you guys with the music, you know, the instruments, you know, the instrumentation, you know, it has, you know, like I said, it has that classic prog sound, and then it has pop sound, and it's like kind of, you can tell so, some lean a little more prog and some of them lean a little more pop but it's like just it's i think it's a perfect balance to get people in the album you know because nowadays it's like they're either people are doing either too much prog in a in an album and it uh i wouldn't say scares people off but it's like you know you need some sort of a balance you know you need you need that, you know, how you have, a, you know, you know, your longer songs and you need to balance them with, I think, with shorter songs, you know, so, you know, it depends on, you know, nowadays you don't, you don't need to, you know, you can market them that way, you know, whereas, you know, years ago, it's like, you know, how the record labels would force and, oh, you need a, 
a shorter pop song, but you know, I think when you do it naturally, that's when you, you get something memorable. But when someone forces you to do it, you know, it's like, wow, you're not going to get something. It may be a hit, but that's not it. It's like, it's going to be one of those uh, be on a one hit wonders type of a thing. Well, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping no, in. Go ahead. Go ahead. But, uh, um, actually, this is kind of thanks to you, Ron, but uh, we have a lot of material all over the place. On, right. uh, you know, my, Mark might have something to hand to you. Uh, uh, you might find something if you look it up on, a, if you Google it, but it's all over the place. And, and thanks to you and your efforts to try to track stuff down, we decided to put it all in one place and start a label so we could uh, uh, oh, cool. manage all this material. And so when you go looking for any of the many projects Jeremy does uh, and the things that I, I do that I that aren't uh, major releases, I can't play somebody else's stuff, uh, but I, I can do my own thing. So anyhow, uh, um, thanks to you it's an opportunity to put everything in one place and it, it's really wide variety i mean there are 17 minute progressive rock uh uh voyages and journeys right. uh and there's there's also three minute uh pop songs uh that that uh um has some really good playing on it uh but but our pop they're pop tunes specifically because i'm fascinated with earworms and the things that make people always go back to the same songs again and the psychology of it oh yeah you know that that's the one thing it's like um you know there's one band that i'm a, a pretty good big fan of uh from england called iq and they put out uh song you know various length songs but one of their more progressive remember the song's title but one of the more progressive ones I was only like uh three three and a two and a half minute song hmm. and through the corridors and it's uh it's about a three two and a half maybe three minute song and it was probably had so many different changes you know chord changes and time changes that it was like um up until that point of me listening to it i always thought you know for a progressive rock song it had to have been eight plus minutes or else you know it wouldn't qualify you know like or like some you know some you know, some of the bands now that they feel that they need to put a, a 20 minute epic on their album or else you know they'll lose their prog credentials you know and it's like i i used to think that up until about the about the mid 90s and then after that i was like going you know it's all about the content it's not uh i guess you call it quality not quantity you know because you can make a uh an epic epic sounding or a, a complex sounding five minute song just as well as you know a 20 minute you know it's like it's really depending on how it comes out naturally and when i one time when i was speaking with the the now x keyboardist for their iq he explained that to me because i asked him i said you know are you guys going to do any more epics you know 20 minute songs and he said well if it happens it's going to happen naturally we're not going to force ourselves and that's the one thing it's like i see it you know a lot of bands and it's usually now on uh you know dropping it inside out music it's usually on that label that you find a lot of prog bands that are putting out those long epics and it's almost maybe 
the labels asking the bands to do that. It's almost like the exact opposite of telling the bands to do a pop song, like do a long song, you know. And yeah, well, I, mean, I, I agree with you. It, I think it's got to be natural. Um, you know, if it if it works as a twenty minute piece, that's fine. If it works as you know three or four shorter pieces, uh, you know, that, that might work better. Uh, the challenge is to weave any of those parts together. Um, I have a tendency to, you know, as I'm sure Dan will confirm, uh, sometimes put too many parts in. And um, I, get, I get my best feedback from Dan and he will say, well, you know, this, this, maybe this has one part too many, or maybe you repeated this part too many times. And so it did make me go back and and think more critically of uh, about arrangement and things like that. Uh, and it's it's hard because you know the roots of Prague. If you go back to you know one of my favorite uh, epics, I guess is close to the edge, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Uh, and it's really hard to you know you you certainly can't reproduce something like that, and you don't want to just try to copy that format so it, it's got to be it's got to be something that's natural so for example um, i'm in this project uh called iconic sky with two of the singers uh from secret martyrs club and that's uh, robin shell and and john beagley and uh the opening track on 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 our album uh is an epic um and it really started with uh, Robin had this idea uh, and a theme uh, actually about Hollywood um, and about um, a screenwriter who goes to Hollywood to make it big. And he had written, uh, he'd written this piece about it and sent it to us. And so that got the rest of us thinking about, you know, what would happen to this person um, and try to think of a story. And then we develop different parts around that story. And then it, it ended up being an epic piece, but it wasn't, um, we didn't go in and say, okay, we're gonna write a 20 minute long song. It just evolved that way. Right, the, I think the best songs are, those length songs are the ones that evolve and you know, and get worked out. They're not like basically, you know, like you were saying, you know, I, in the early days of the, you know, Pro Tools and stuff like that, you know, people were cutting, pasting uh, songs that together in order to qualify as an epic, you know, and some of them, I, some of them I've forgotten because they were just so bad, badly, Attached to each other, that it's like it had, you know, one had a certain um, vibe, and then it went into another, which, which it had nothing whatsoever to do with the other one. I mean, it was, it was like, you know, night and day kind of comparison, you know, and it's like, uh, and it's like I, I got tired of that was. Um, I'm not sure if you remember that label Magna Carta. Yeah. They were they were really um, in the mid 90s very notorious for getting uh, bands to do uh, things like that. Um, and also they had a lot of bands that sounded so much alike to each other. Right. And, and uh, there was like no variety to it you know it's like and then of course you had the back then you had all the the, the vocalists were either trying to sound like like uh john anderson peter gabriel and once in a while ian anderson you know right. it's like none of them were trying none of them were doing their own voice they were trying to emulate their their heroes a little too much to point you know being a clone and it's like i i mean if it comes out naturally that's that's one thing but if you're, you're forcing your vocals to do a certain style you know or not so much a style a certain person 
you know, like it, it again, it got it got very boring after a while hearing, okay, there's another band where the singer sounds like, you know, exactly the same, or you know, you can uh, you can tell who they um whether they're gonna sound like a Genesis band or they'll sound like sound like a yes band or maybe even a Jetro Toll band. You know, it's like they don't have their own identity. Well they had to uh um they were kind of slaves to the record company in the ways that we aren't these days. Uh the means of production uh and the cost of production have come down so much and and the way music is distributed has changed so much that nobody needs a record label uh you need a uh you need somebody who's if you want to try to make money in music which is hard to do uh you want somebody who could uh push your your uh material uh through social media in ways that people seem to be able to find it organically when in fact it's really not organic at all but uh um we're able to do what we want because there's nobody telling us we can't really i mean right. sometimes i say sometimes i might say if i'm producing it we shouldn't try let's try something else but there's no a and r guy hanging over my shoulder saying you know this needs to sound you need to redo the vocals to sound more ethereal or something like that we do what we want and if people dig it that's fantastic and if they don't that's fine too they'll probably if they go looking for other stuff we did, there might be something in there for them. You know, you'd be surprised. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, the only down, downside with in today, with ex, with the exception of Amcam, is you got the. I have just about everyone I've talked to. You know, they always you know say something bad about Spotify. Because of you know you don't the musicians aren't being compensated for on on that streaming service, and the audience doesn't understand. You know, uh, I was mentioned one of uh, one of my friends I had talked to about you know he's a he's a, a music teacher and talking to his kids in class and. He was talking about the CD, and and they were going with the CD, and he felt like, oh my God, I just aged myself here, you know, and uh, and he was explaining. He said, well, I could go listen to it free on on Spotify, and it's like, you know, it's so hard, you know, you got to explain to those type of people that um, music isn't free. Uh, the musicians don't get their instruments and if they don't have their own recording studios they don't go and rent get free recording time you know or they don't get uh every, nothing nothing's for free so it's like that's what a lot of them they feel okay well it's on it's on a streaming service i don't have to go and buy a cd and or buy a download you know like on on uh, Bandcamp, you know, it, there's they don't they don't see that there's a a, a product to be purchased, and that's that's unfortunately um, a lot of people that I've spoken to they feel that that's going to go towards where you know musicians you know are going to probably just be putting out individual songs because why almost why go why bother doing putting together a, a collection of songs, you know, that we used to call an album? Why do that when it's people are gonna go through and just pick certain songs and not listen to the rest? You know, at least by doing I think by doing individual songs, they'll, you know, it's okay if they only picked uh Three out of the and you release that that month or year or something like that, you know. So, so I I personally, as you can tell, I'm I'm a physical media person, you know. I don't I I haven't with 
very rare exceptions have bought download. Um, I was always afraid that my computer would crash. It'll go with it. I know you can upload stuff to clouds, but I'm feeling also the same kind of a thing where you, you know, you constantly hear about things being hacked that it can crash. So at least if my computer crashes with the music that's already on it, there's the backup right there. You know, I don't have to go, you know, it'll mean if I had a download, I would have to go repurchase the download, you know, so. I mean, yeah, I think, I think the model has completely changed in terms of how musicians are compensated. I mean, there was a time obviously before recorded music where uh, you'd have patrons uh, or musicians would be giving lessons. Um, you hear a lot these days about um, these packages you could buy at concerts that cost a lot of money, but you get to go meet the musicians. And some people don't like that, although my view is, well, if, if musicians aren't going to be paid uh, for, for the records they're making, uh, then they need to find another way to be compensated. Um, right. So there's, I don't, personally don't see anything wrong with that. It's just a different model. Um, uh, the problem with CDs, like we did not put out Secret Martyrs Club on any kind of physical media because, um, frankly, because of the expense, uh, neither one of us are particularly good at promotion. Um, and I could tell you from the various projects I've been on, I, I have thousands of what future generations will view as drink coasters in my basement. And um, I'm expecting archeologists are gonna wonder why we cared about not marking up our furniture so much. Right. Um, so, uh, but I did find uh, there is a website called Kunaki that allows you to have CDs made on demand and they're pretty good quality, I've used them. Um, so, you know, I could order a box of 10 of them for myself or to sell at performances or more. Right. And if somebody wants it, they could click on it and they'll manufacture it and send it to them. And to me, that's probably the most, uh, the, the best model that I've seen because I don't have thousands of CDs in my basement. And uh, if people want physical media, they can get it. Right. Well, one, one person that I, I spoke to uh, a few months back, he said he was cleaning out his basement and he found two boxes of, I want to say, either 50 or 100 CDs of his first very first CD that he put out in the mid-90s. And he goes, they, if I didn't, if I didn't clean out my basement, I wouldn't have known I had these things there. And um, so he's been uh, using that band camp and he, and he says, I'm only releasing whatever I do now forward. I'm only releasing as a digital release. Right. And so I, I understand both, both sides of the argument, you know, physical to a digital, um, I think physical is great for for the bands because they, you know, like you said, you know, they don't have to order up a thousand CDs and and um, and then have half of them, you know, basically from your coach. Um, but then on the other side, it's like, you know, for the listener, you know, nowadays the listeners, everything is. Uh, everybody's always on the go so it's like you know to have your you know your different devices you know like, like your tablets or your phones you know you you want to be able to have your music portable and and for me the music is portable because i um a lot of the stuff that i buy from amazon i, I want to say a good majority of it you always get a notification that you know, the Amazon Music has your has a digital copy of it for you to listen to there. So, you know, for me, it's like I got it here and I got it on on digital. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm happy because you know that means that I don't have to carry 
stacked up 10 CDs in my car. You know, I can right. just have the the USB, you know, plug in the USB drive, you know, and. Although it's, uh, it's really hard to put cover art on a USB drive. Right. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, so we've been talking a lot about the business of music, but uh, uh, the restriction that we have now, you see, I'm serious. When I talk with my eyes closed, I'm very serious about something. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, um, it's a... Uh, hard to to credit everybody and really to say to give your personal message to the listener when you don't have uh any physical media to put that on it comes as a file with your with your uh disc oh, excuse me not your disc with your download and then if you want you could double click on it and see uh you know who produced it who arranged it who wrote the songs who performed on it what instruments they used uh, who they want, who the musicians want to thank, the manufacturers they want to thank, uh, who mastered the record, you know, all the kind of stuff that we used to dig about getting an LP with the Roger Dean cover art and the, right. uh, the, the, uh, or some of the Zappa stuff. Uh, oh God, I should know the name of the guy that, like on the Grand Wazoo or something like that, where it's, or Uncle Meat, where it's just, this visually stunning thing that you, you have fun of while you're listening to the music, you could sit there and look at, you know, uh, this new dimension, which is the, the the visual dimension. You don't get to do that anymore. Uh, it kind of bums me out a little bit, you know? Yeah, because, uh, you know, one of the more recent things that I bought was uh, this thing, Watch, and look at, you know, it's got all this, this packaging to it, you know, and it's so, I mean, newer bands, uh, because, you know, they're not, don't have back, I guess the backing to produce something like that, it, you know, you won't see so much of that. I mean, there's, I think there's a few exceptions of some bands that, you know, on that, uh, on it, uh, the Inside Out music label, like right over here, I'm a uh, band called Frost. They put out a box set, you know, which was kind of cool. I mean, but I have never expect newer bands to put something that elaborate out because of the cost. You know? And but then for it seems like you know, of our generation, we like to open up things and read the liner notes and you know. And learn, you know, learn more about the band, you know, you know, obviously now today you can go to Google and find out about most, most bands, you know, but, you know, for Google, you know, that's how we found out about the bands. And, um, yeah, yeah, so it's like, it's both ways, you know, digital, physical, you know, if they both have their the pros and cons, you know, one of, for me, the major con is I can't, can't open up the book. But the major, you know, pro, the major pro is you're reaching this, if they so desire to click on what you're doing, an audience that you would never be able to reach before. So that's the pro, you know, that anybody anywhere in the world with a computer and the ability to download something could grab one of your tunes they don't have to go through hearing about it on the radio if if you manage to get a tune on the radio or seeing it in sync. Going to Sam Goodies, remember Sam Goodies and oh, buying yeah. the record and taking it home and taking off the wrapping and all of that. Uh, they don't have to do that anymore. They just dial up on you know on the iPhone or whatever, download the tune and listen to it. And there's a price to be paid for that, which is losing the other bits of magic of vinyl. Or even right. even CD. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I um, I do miss going to the, rec the record stores because you know, I used to live in uh, the LA area and used to go to uh, uh, out in Pasadena, a place called Publons, and then in uh, down in Hollywood, Aaron's Records. You know, so it's like I. I used to make a trek 
every other weekend down to Aaron's Records because I used to have this import section that was amazing. I mean, you find stuff in there you never find at any other store or even Tower, when Tower had their good size import sections um, on Sunset Boulevard, you know, so it's like, it was a, it was probably a, a very sad, I mean, at least for me, it was a sad day when Tower, you know, closed up and then Aaron's closed up, but then, I, you know, Hollywood got uh, Amoeba Records in, in exchange for it, which is, haven't been to the new, the new um, store, uh, but this uh, friend of mine said that it's down the street from the old one, and but they said it's all one level. It's not a, you know, you don't have to climb upstairs to the where the videos were. So that's that's a plus, but it's still it's huge. That store was huge. I couldn't. I couldn't get through the whole thing, and uh, it had to take me like two weekends to get through the whole whole store. And so, you know, I do miss that. I mean, we do have uh, um, out here in Maine, we have a, a a chain, a small chain called Bull Moods, and. They, they're or they're more of the um, like a big chain store types where they don't have a, a lot of imports or any of the more interesting releases that you find at like those Hollywood shops. You know, so you know, I mean, granted, nowadays you got the computer, you can go to Amazon or anywhere else online and order your CDs, you know, and, and you get them, you know, a few days later, you know. So, I mean, you give up one thing for the other, you know, but I still miss going to the record shops and coming through and, you know, finding something that I wasn't, I wasn't going there to look for, you know. Yeah. Which record? I mean, you you were mentioning Sam Goody. Uh, I bet you. Do you remember one called Licorice Pizza? Mm, no, I don't remember. Okay. That. All I remember is driving past it. It was on uh, on Ventura Boulevard. Uh, I think it was either before or after the the. Uh, our records that's what's out there. Well, Jeremy, Jeremy's in a, in Maryland. I'm the only one who's in LA. Uh, right. And kind of funny that they would write a song called Hollywood Hates You. And and the only person who lives in Hollywood is me. Well, uh, I think um, <laughs> Rob Robin, I think, was there for a bit. Oh, that's right. Robin used to live here, too. Yeah. So he does have some feel for it. But uh, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure back in the day, Rockville had had their record stores, right? Well, uh, so um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. Um, I mean, other than Tower Records, um, the names has slipped my mind, but there was a, a local record store here that uh, I used to go to. And um, yeah, so I definitely miss that experience. And I remember growing up in New Jersey. Um, uh, the record store uh, in Livingston, where I think I got my first uh, real book there because they had it. They had records and they had the, the real book, but you had to get it under the counter because it wasn't authorized. But um, so, yeah, you don't get those experiences these days. Yeah, and, and the young, you know, the younger kids won't won't get that experience. I mean, we still remember it, but they won't even, you know, they'll probably go record store what's that <laughs> you know it's like well, the fight the fight to keep amoeba alive uh that took some uh, you know because they got kicked out of their location that took some doing uh aaron's records was right up the street from a place i used to work called Klasky chupo uh where we did rugrats and the like 
and uh oh yeah aaron's we would you know i'd be there the guy who owned klasky uh, co-owned klasky chupa would be there other people from lunch would be there uh you would see everyone you knew uh from that arts district you know during their lunch hour or after work going and seeing what's new because you get that you'd be exposed to all kinds of things that you wouldn't normally see uh especially in the import section for sure I, oh yeah those are things that i never would have even been been uh, exposed to but that's when i started losing interest losing interest in in prague a little bit uh thank god jeremy is around to to hold the torch to be the torch bearer for the prague end of, <laughs> of things uh not that you know i do love prague and this is a Prague show, but the right. psychology, psychology of music is fascinating to me. We were discussing taking multiple tunes and stringing them together and them not working. But if you use the motif, the lead motif from one of the uh, from the beginning tune, it, you could string them together. So there's a whole psychology of, of music that I find find absolutely fascinating. Uh, the ability to make people feel things without actually being around them, but they're here, your words. That's the thing about the secret martyrs club stuff that I like so much is that, uh, and I didn't write any of the lyrics. Well, I guess I did, but Jeremy wrote on, wrote the serious stuff and, uh, I found it very moving. And after it was all done, I thought, well, maybe that'll move some, maybe that'll change some minds. Maybe that'll move some people uh but um the ability to make people feel things just by moving air molecules around in a pleasing fashion has always right. has always fascinated me well you know i i i find now uh especially with the technologies you know how you make music that people are find, are getting more interested in in prog that because uh, I watch a lot of of these um, reaction videos on YouTube, where the younger people are listening to the, you know prog music, and it's just it's just funny. Some of them are really funny the way they react to it. Like you know, oh my God, it's a twenty minute song. How am I going to sit through all this? You know, and it's like <laughs> there are songs that are like that. You know, I feel that way. But then there's songs that that are long and when it's over it's like you go is that it you know you know i kind of want i want to hear more of this you know and the only the only way you can is just to hit the repeat button but it's um i think they're reaching a little uh people that were i want to say in a way anti prog in the in the 90s and early 2000s, you've seen less of those attitudes. They're more like, they're, some people are a little more interested in it now. It's, I think it's because of YouTube. You know, I, I mean, I could be completely wrong about that, but I think YouTube is really kind of steering people back into the prog scene or for the first time into the prog scene, you know. Yes, there's a lot of good ones. I mean, there was, I, I watched one, uh, he's a composer. I, I think he's like in his mid, late 30s, I want to say. And just his reaction to, uh, uh, he just did a 45 minute reaction to Carcass. And he found the video uh, on, YouTube, where it showed the the what do you call it? the note the notes and the um, score uh, what the score and everything on each, on each section and it's like normally he would explain it but he said now I got a place that I can point to and show people where what's going on and and for me those reaction videos even though it's a song that I've heard hundreds of times but when i get to i get to sometimes hear it through fresh ears when they explain it or they they react to it in a way and it's like it, it like it 
triggers back to the first time I heard it, you know, and, and, and it's just, it's very fascinating to hear people getting into this music, you know, I mean, we're always told that it's a, it's a, it's a dead uh, genre, but it's, I, I mean, it may not be as flourishing as it once was, but it's, I don't think it's dead. I think it's just, it's there for people that are, you know, willing to, to you know, expand their ears and uh, listen to something completely different. You know? That's why, you know, like you were saying, you know, the psychology of music, I mean, I never, I'm not really into psychology and stuff, but I know how music affects you, you know, uh, your emotions and everything like that. And, you know, I don't like using the word trigger, but it's, uh, it, it hits it hit certain emotions and, uh, and, you know, and, and it stays with you and it gets imprinted into your brain, you know, when the first time you heard, you know, let's say like Tardis. When I first heard that, I was like, my mind was blown. And then watching this guy uh, react to it, it just like it got blown again. Yeah, I think a great example of that is soundtrack music, um, where I think the idea is to really cue the, the viewer slash listener on what to feel, you know, the classic, you know, open the door to the dark basement and start walking down and you hear um, you hear a musical cue telling you to be fearful uh, or, you know, the big scene at the end of the Marvel movie where they win. Right. Um, and you get that theme. But tying that back to the Secret Martyrs Club, one of the things that I think Dan did so well on uh, the opening track, Everything Will Be Fine, uh, if you notice, um, the intensity of the song builds very gradually from the beginning to the end. Right. Um, to by the end, with everything that's going on, it's pretty terrifying almost. Whereas in the beginning, it's just, you know, it's just very mellow and, um, and just gradually builds uh, until you get to this terrifying ending, which really is exactly what I think we wanted to do, uh, not only with that track, but with the others is to try to wake, wake people up. Um, right. And I think that's one way of using that psychology to get your message across. Right. Yeah, we did that tune, uh, everything will be fine. And most assuredly, everything won't be fine. Oh. And we knew, that, we knew that when we did it, and a lot of the songs uh, require listening to the lyrics above and beyond the chorus, much like Born in the USA. If you only listen to those first few words, you're cut, right. you don't know what the hell is going on after that. Right. Fre frequently, your average listener, that's about as far as they're going to delve into it. I think your prog listeners are much more interested uh, and, and will pay attention uh, to your lyrics and even when the lyrics are doing something that seems to clash with the music, like why is the music so pretty and beautiful when the when the lyrical content is so horrifying, and that's right. That's because that's how life can sometimes be, and so exactly. uh, you know that's just uh, if you're willing to sit down, and and that's the beauty of prog fans is that they are willing to sit down and listen to the lyrics and listen to the playing, you know, and the act accuracy of the playing and the counterpoint uh and all and which is a different world than pop which has its own uh uh tricks of the trade to make right. people use it. but listening to things uh that is a very powerful sense of memory just like smell is a very powerful sense of memory and you'll listen you'll hear Tarkus and you'll say oh man the first time I heard that the first time I put Neil down on that and there was that cover of that uh that tank Arm, the armadillo that had that was attached to a tank. I mean, what kind of right. music are you going to get? And all of a sudden, there's that distorted uh, B B three that cuts through everything, and and it's just majestic. Uh, that really, for me, was an eye opener. 
for me, uh, it's hearing Birds of Fire was right. an eye opener. The way I found that was at our public, our, our local public library. I saw, there were records up, and I saw this really cool uh, visual on the on the cover of the record, the the bright orange and and yellow uh, of the Birds of Fire, and uh, I listened to that record. I wasn't expecting anything. I didn't know what to get. I, you know, I didn't know what was going on. I was just a kid, and I was like. They had this in the local public library. This is incredible. This is my. Right. If any of the librarians knew that this was there, they would <laughs> they would go run screaming. And that was a major influence, I think, on on both of us, Jeremy and I. We both, uh, you know, that was a big deal. That that record and that came out of the local library. So uh, that was just interesting how that how that happened. But uh, yeah, the. My uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. My uh, my full introduction into Prague. Uh, I had a partial one when I was uh, in 1980. When I was 14 years old, I told I tell this story all the time. Um, a friend of mine gives me uh, Rush Permanent Waves. It just was released a few months prior, and I'm like, going, "Why are you giving me this?" Because before that, all I would listen to was AM radio in the car, you know, I couldn't, honestly, at that point, I couldn't care less. You know, I was that, you know, the pop listener that I didn't care about all the, the details and I didn't care about the music. It's like, you know, I heard the song and they, the DJ announced what it was and it's like, it just, you know, okay, whatever. But then once I got, when he gave me that cassette and I played it in my tape player, I was like going, okay, now, you know, looking back, I said, I think he knew that I needed that stuff in that right direction. Of, and it took me about a decade till I got, um, started working at a record show. And the manager there, he was into every kind of music that was ever. Um, so he, he, I was always into, at that time, this was about 90, I want to say 91, 92, somewhere in that area. Um, all I was listening to was that, that thrash, thrash metal, you know. So, you know, how the some of those small record stores they have, you know, the employees always playing music on their over the air. And so it's like I was playing it, and he got tired of it. And he playing the same stuff. He said, Okay, look, I got something for you that I think will. He put in pink, crimson, red, and all of a sudden it was like, like in that uh, those old cartoons with the light bulb goes up over your head. It was like that was like, um, I kind of call that my little musical epiphany. You know, it's like, and that from that point forward, it's like went into different stuff and like you know, Birds of Fire. Um, he played that uh, over the air. You know, maybe a, a few months after putting on red and I was like going, okay, what do you have of them there's in the store right now? And he goes, and he said, well, you got a couple of them. I would go and buy them. You know, I would, everything that, you know, that I started listening to Hogwise or Fusion was based right there. So it's like, I didn't hear a lot of that in the, in the eighties because I, I wasn't really into it, you know. I was more into, you know, thrash metal. Uh, right after high school in '85, you know, my friend introduced me to that. So '85 to '92, that's all I was listening to. And then the manager there, he just turned, said, you know, he opened up my ears to different stuff, you know. And I got, I was, whatever he was playing on the, on the store CD player. You know, I listened to it and, you know, if I liked it, I went and bought it, you know. And nowadays, with whenever I get a CD from a band, first thing I do is I, if they don't have an extensive liner notes, I look for um, a website. I want to find out what the song was about, why it was written, you know, who was on it, you know. Anything, 
I needed to find out information about the band. I needed to find out what the song was about. You know. So and, why? So why somebody wrote the song is important to you. Yes. Why okay. they wrote it? You know where? You know their influence. You know did they? Did they see something that caused them to write write those? You know the lyrics or. You know that's that's something kind of important because it it helps me better understand the song when I'm listening to it. Um, I'll one thing is like with the uh, you know going back to Tarkus, the guy explained what what Tarkus but in everything and uh, each of the the movements you know the the names how they were characters in the in the big story and it's like I. All I knew was Tarkus, you know, because of the album cover. I didn't, didn't know all the stuff. And it wasn't until recently finding out about that. And then the King Crimson song, Starless, you know, he explained that too. And it's like, and so when I go listen to those songs again, now I'm hearing something different. So it's like, uh, that's the other thing. It's like, uh, you get, once in a great while, you get, get to hear those songs with with fresh ears again and it's it's very rarely because there's some songs out there that you know they feel like they almost worn out the welcome in your brain <laughs> you know you, you know you don't really want to hear them again because you know exactly what's going to happen next there's no surprises to it and me that's what i like about Prague is that there's surprises to the song you, you're going to hear something different the next time you listen to it because you know you um and that's the i mean that's the the thing that i get from it you know i mean i you know everybody's different with how they they react to the music and it's like i i just like the fact that i can hear something different each time uh, and a majority uh everything i listen to is on the head headphones so you know so i don't get any outside world uh distraction you know i i saw a t-shirt out there that, that explained that perfectly it said headphones on world off and and it's pretty much that's what it is it's like you know I, you know, I, I always thought when people have their headphones on, you don't, you don't bother them, you know, because they're busy with something, listening to something. Um, that's where I, I listen to, a, like I said, a majority of the music that way. Um, I don't really have, you know, being in an apartment building, I don't have the luxury of having a nice hi-fi set where you can blast the music as loud as you, you know, you want without disturbing the neighbor above or below you or to the side of you. you know, at least this way I can I can go as loud as I want with the headset and not bother anybody. You know. But that that's what I'd say. It, you know, lyrics and, and why the song was written is is one of those important things. That's why I like when I listen to your stuff, I'm still kind of getting the thing, but I like how the the title, everything is will be fine, and then but the lyric content, it's not. You know, I I like I like that where it, it's it's like you got the happiness, whether it's song title or how the instrumentation is, but then the lyrics are just you know dark as can be, you know, and the that those that kind of you know, I'm sure there's a, a term of what that, uh, how you would describe that, you know, you know, the only thing I could think of is like in deceptive. marketing. What was that? Deceptive. <laughs> yeah, deceptive. It kind of, deceptive, you know, and then also like a, a bait and switch, you know, kind of a thing. It's like, we're going to, or, or, you know, like, is it, yeah, deceptive. That's. That song right there is like when you hear the title, it's like I was like going, okay, I was gonna expect a really happy, cheery tune, but it really wasn't. 
No, not at all. Yeah, um, I think that because Jeremy writes, I'm talking for Jeremy again, but he writes a lot of instrumental stuff, certainly more instrumental stuff than I do at all. And uh, uh, that's it's a little harder to pull that off uh, in the strictly instrumental realm. When you have lyrics, you can do that very easily. But uh, um, blending everything together to make it accessible is a difficult thing to do. I think Jeremy will concur on that. And uh, uh, he doesn't really need me to, to do anything anymore. You know, he does. He has his own thing going on. He doesn't have to, you know, have me check mixes or anything. His mixing is great. And uh, so he's responsible for all of the uh, all of the uh, musical uh, instrumental content that comes out of anything that our family does. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't think that I don't think that's. That. I don't think that's entirely true, but uh, at least on, on this record, um, you know, the comments I've gotten back, of, a lot of them have been on the guitar playing, which is mostly Dan's. Um, we've had, we had some special guests uh, contributing some guitar stuff, but it's mostly Dan. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the reason I do the instrumental music is again, because nobody wants to hear me sing. So, um, but I, you know, I do like the instrumental music, and I, I agree it's harder to get a, a direct message across um, for something like this, uh, strictly in the instrumental realm. So, but over the last, over the last, uh, I don't know, Jeremy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's been about five years. We've been so fortunate to work with guys like Mark McCray and Robin Shell and John Beagley. Uh, uh, it's really kind of made it possible for us to do since neither of us really sing, right? right. Uh, I, I do the BVs, but that's just out of necessity. Uh, um, to get a guy like Mark singing for us, it's just a fantastic luxury. And it's, it's so informal the way we do it, as opposed to the way I would have had to do it 10 years ago. Now we could just say, Hey, let's do a song. Let's let's, you know, I'll shoot you what we've got and, and you can shoot us what you've got and we'll go back and forth. And uh, yeah, now we have vocals on our stuff and we're writing lyrics and we have a stable of people that we like to use. And it's just even over even during the pandemic, we were getting stuff done because, yeah. we were, you know, we were able to. We didn't have to go into somebody else's studio and and through the beauty of uh, the Internet, we're shooting high quality, you know, audio files back and forth. Right. Uh, it's just been so great. And working with Robin, he's in the UK, but it's almost like he's next door, you know, and so right. yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. Uh, you know, for uh, just as an example, um, after Neil Peart passed away, uh, I wanted to do some kind of tribute. Um, you know, as a Rush fan, um, but uh, I didn't want to do a cover. I wanted to do something original and I started working on some music and I asked Dan to help out with it. And then um, we asked Robin to do the vocals on it. But what really blew me away about what he did on that, um, on the second verse of that especially, he thought of it in such a completely different way than I had in my mind that literally the first time I heard it, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And it took me a few times and it's pretty brilliant um, what he did. And so, um, you know, John does the same kind of thing. Um, on the, I, I work with him in Formative and an Iconic Sky and, and, and just the ability to be that creative um, in just think in ways that I, I can't think and Dan can't think. Um, you know, Mark uh, sang on the, on the third track on, on the Secret Martyrs Club, uh, a song about the refugee crisis. And, and he did this real lift at the end that was something, again, I hadn't really thought of. So I think we're, we're very fortunate to have um, really talented people to work with uh, on this. And uh, yeah, I would not, 
I would not have the ability to do any kind of vocal vocal songs, uh, you know, because I can't sing. <laughs> Dan can sing, so it really helps to have uh, friends that um, are willing to to work with us on this. Uh, speaking of Mark, he's in the the chat room right now. <laughs> oh, hey, Mark. Hey, how you doing, man? Yeah, he, he's everything I've ever sent him. He's nailed to the nth degree and the comment i always get is who is who is that singer and how does he cover so much stuff uh so yeah mark mark is a big part of it robin is a robin and john are major parts of it too and if without those guys uh because they each have very different voices especially robin uh so it's it's just so wonderful to be able to do this at all well i don't remember if it was you or if it was Jeremy, no, it had to have been you when I mentioned that one song and I, <laughs> I'll tell it here. So it's like, uh, I was asking, who's that, that girl singing? <laughs> and it was Robin. It's just because he had that high voice and I was like going, and then it was just, and then once you told me who it was and then I went and listened to it again, I, I go, oh, okay, he's doing you said he was kind of. Uh, you said he was kind of almost like in the John Anderson kind of camp. I think that was. Uh, he has. Uh, he's a natural soprano. Uh, he sings full voice soprano, and he does it very well. And he's yeah. a great composer, and he's a great vocal arranger, uh, and, and a great. So, key, he's a great keyboard player too. Uh, well, he he's got his bases covered. Uh, Mark certainly has his bases covered. Uh, oh, yeah. He did, we did a tune that was a cover of a Thomas Dolby tune called Airwaves. Beautiful song. And uh, and his voice was perfect for it. And so uh, we did this cover, and he laid down an acoustic guitar part for me that really uh, kind of finalized the instrumental arrangement for the song. And I didn't even think of it. So uh, um, it's just... It's just great. I mean, I wish we could all be in the same place at the same time, because uh, even better things happen then. But just the nature oh, yeah. of the way things are, we we can't be in the same room at the same time. Uh, right, right. And I mean, you, you guys got the the magic of this, right? You know, of you know, sending the files over. You know, but like you said, being in the room together, you know, it's you'd be able to instantly get feedback oh, from the other person people are unable to tell your intent if they send you a complete completed performance of the vocals let's say and you and you're not in the same room you haven't been going through it line by line or paragraph by paragraph they just did what they thought was right and suddenly there's somebody telling them now what you did was wrong here from from measure x to measure x i need you to do this and and you need to deal with the kind of people who are able to accept that and as part of the necessity of us not being in the same room. You're gonna complete your performance, you're gonna send it, and then we're gonna pull it apart and you're gonna to have to do punch-ins and the like. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend you, but this part here really needs to be more like this. We have to dispense with that stuff now because we can't afford to spend time massaging everybody's feelings. Right. So, right. Uh, so uh, we don't do it, you know, th those days are, are over we just say okay i dig what you did i'm going to cut it up uh we may have to do another couple of things here and there but i like your idea uh but you know people just don't do one take and walk away and, and that's it you know right ideas bounce back and forth uh i wish jeremy i was just gonna say i wish jeremy and i could be in the same place for any more than one day <laughs> We'd probably get an awful lot done if we were but uh yeah just, that's true although uh the, the technology is almost there i i uh tested out uh a setup with a friend of mine who's a drummer and uh for real time playing and it, it actually worked um i'm assuming that technology is going to get better but it still doesn't beat uh being in the same room with someone 
Right. Yeah. But, you know, um, I was going, you know, going back to, you know, the live thing now. Um, okay. Of course, we have the pandemic now that is going to, I mean, we're slowly coming out of it. I think some people are racing uh, to the cliff really too quickly. You know, the, uh, it's like we need to utilize this technology on, online to do streaming concerts more, you know, make it where it's more of the norm instead of, you know, something, oh, this band just did it, you know, and then six months later, oh, this other band did, you know, it's like, because uh, it, it, for the pandemic, it's, it works perfectly for that. But then after the pandemic, um, let's say, for instance, Secret Martyrs Club decides they want to go live, but they're only going to do it in either out in LA or, you know, in Maryland. You know, you're not going to do like multi cities and because you can't. So, wherever you do it at, you set up the live stream for, say, someone like myself in Maine be able to see it because I wouldn't be able to to afford to fly to either of the locations. And there's other people that maybe they found out about you and they want to see you and they they're in Australia and they can't afford to come. I was thinking there's like that's where the, the live streaming can come into um, into play. I mean granted for you guys you're not going to be able to see how we're reacting to your music. You won't be able to, you know, the feed, you know, feeding off of each other, you know, the thing, but it's the next best thing until we're completely out of the woods. And well, speaking of that, I mean, during the pandemic, we saw a number of live streaming shows and it, it was interesting, the ones that, uh, you know, there were basically two different ways. There were, um, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Chris Teeley, uh, he's a mandolin player. He's an outstanding mandolin player. And he has a band called Nickel Creek uh, that he's in. Um, we saw a live streaming show and people were making live comments. And in between songs, they would read the comments and respond to people. They had some technical glitches. For the most part, it worked. Um, I watched uh, the Pineapple Thief did a uh, live concert. That was pre-recorded. Uh, I think yeah. it was live, but it was pre-recorded. I'd say the production values on that one were much higher because of that. Uh, on at the same time, it wasn't. It didn't have all the spontaneity of the other show. Right. Um, but I enjoyed both. Uh, did I enjoy it as much as being there in person? Probably not. But. Um, on the other hand, being stuck inside during the pandemic, it was great to be able to see things like that. And it is true, you can see and hear things a lot better than you know you can sometimes at live shows. But you oh. miss the smell of the crowd. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, Mark and missed the, uh, the germs of the crowd too. Yes. Mark, Mark asked, uh, it says, have you ever seen the video of Chris from Nickel Creek working with John Bryan on the Step Brothers soundtrack? I haven't, but uh, I, I, it sounds like it's something I need to go check out. Oh, and then uh, someone in the chat goes, uh, that prog stock that I was mentioning, uh, it's returning in October and it's gonna both be live and virtual. So yeah, you... see, that's, a, that's a great combination for what you were talking about because you know, people who are nearby, they can go see it and they can enjoy it in the classic concert way but people right. who might not be able to make it can at least um participate and and get you know get some oh, yeah. enjoyment out of it oh yeah you know and especially if you're at home and if you've got a nice uh big screen tv to, and if it's uh i mean i just recently got uh it's a roku tv but it's 4k you know ultra high def and it's like it's just amazing you know just the, the difference. I, mean, I the other night I I watched. Uh, here, here's a kind of a, a prog connection here. Um, the original Dawn of the Dead. You know they had you know, 
the go go goblin plane on it. Uh, I got the the new 4K scan that they that's it's an import, and the color the colors are so vibrant, and it's uh, it's it's almost a, it looked like it's it was, some parts were almost like recorded today it was like that clear and to be on a big you know i got a 50 inch tv so be on a 50 inch, i can imagine the people that have those 80 inch tvs can watch concerts and movies you know things you know and and if they have a a surround system you know a good a really good one they're gonna be like engulfed in the sound you know it's gonna be so I mean, for a concert, that that, that would be like the cl probably the closest thing to being there. You yeah, know? and you and you don't have to deal with the people who stand up in front of you and you can't see, or the people <laughs> screaming in your ear. Well, or the people that have their cameras right in front of you. <laughs> unless you have kids, then then you could get that experience at home too. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it's interesting you would mention Goblin because yesterday, as I was going through, uh, I think it was Netflix or something. There's a movie called The Church that has uh, Keith Emerson and Goblin did the soundtrack. Yeah. And, and I'm watching it and I can't, for various reasons, uh, all I could do was really listen to the music. I couldn't watch the visuals because I was so caught up in the fact that Keith Emerson did the music for it. Right. And it right. Was, he didn't really hold back. I mean, there was plenty of Hammond on there too. Oh, uh, yeah. You don't hear a lot yeah. of Hammonds in the, uh, in movie scores these days <laughs> so uh you know big brass hand and the i don't know if he was using the gx1 or whatever synth he was using at the time uh to do the big brass right. stuff. and uh uh i never would have even known about it except i happened to be watching tv at that time uh, right. and it comes up i'm like wow i didn't know he did music for this so i watched about 15 or 20 minutes of a horrible movie just yeah. to hear what he's <laughs> up to and ha whether or not he would change his uh, mo for uh, scoring, and he didn't. It, it was a, it was pretty much Keith. And uh, oh, yeah. he did another another interesting uh, soundtrack. Uh, it was called Godzilla: Final Wars. He he did the um, the soundtrack. He split it up with. I forget who it was, but it was a modern rock band. You know, half of the music was him with the organ going, and then the other one, it's just, you know, an upbeat rock band. I, I kind of want to say Fall Out Boy, but I'm not 100%. I, ca I can't remember exactly. But, you know, like you were saying, is like Keith's music was right. You know, that's where you, you locked in. Once you heard that, it was like going, okay, here's the good part. <laughs> But um, no, that's that's the thing with those Italian horror movies is they are bad, but they have they have something to them that you know that I get drawn to, and a lot of it has to do with um, that Goblin did a, a, a majority of the soundtracks, um, then uh, another keyboardist. Uh, Fabio Fritzi did a couple uh, of the of the other kinds of uh, Italian horror movies that were like the the, the gorier ones. Um, oh yeah, and uh, someone said he did uh, Inferno, which is another Italian horror movie, and uh, Nighthawks, one with uh, Sylvester Stallone. Which was that was a that was a pretty bad movie, but you know, again, the soundtrack is what made it. You know, I guess gave it a redeeming, uh, re, uh, an A an A plus or something like that for the soundtrack. But, um, but it's like the the movie, the movies, those kind of movies. It's like it's almost like it was like a nice little. Uh, or a perfect little uh, marriage of the Prague and, and horror. And, uh, but I don't know if, uh, if, 
if outside of Italian or if if a progress progressive rock band would be able you know to do you know a soundtrack I don't I don't I think it's the I think it's just the weirdness of those, um, you know, like uh, Dario Argento, you know, he has all these weird ideas that that don't really make a lot of sense, but, you know, with the print, put a product soundtrack to it, it, you know, that's, you know, that's the only, only way he can go, at least I think. I mean, there's, um, right over here, I have this one, it's called Demonia. And Demonia is, uh, uh, what's his name, Claudio Simonente from Goblin. That was a band that he did. Um, and they do, theirs is kind of a more prog metal approach. It's like, you know, Goblin on steroids. <laughs> and um, so it's like, they, they I mean, they, I, and they did a concert, I forget, not this one that I have, but they did a concert where they had um, the backdrop, some of the, a, a big screen where different different uh, movies came up and the band would play the soundtrack for that, you know, kind of like a nice little soundtrack night. Oh yeah, Heart of the Sunrise is used for a climax of the movie. Um, yeah, Buffalo 66. And then the other one that has the King Crimson music, uh, uh, Starless uh, was in that Nicolas Cage, Mandy. That looks that pretty. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but this right on the, you know, the, the title, you know, those, you know, the, Beginning titles, and you see music by King Crimson. You know, I'm like, oh, that's never, never would have expected that, but it works. So you, got, uh, you know, you got messages coming in on your uh, yeah, computer as we speak. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, the um, when you go live. They could give you a little chat room on Facebook and so people can kind of talk with each other. And I try to I try to pay attention to it. But um yeah, one, you know, going back to Secret Martyrs Club, the title track. That I'm still trying to figure out what it's about, you know, and I'll I'll get it in in time, but um just the whole feel has, you know, that's, it's a kind of a, maybe I've got this wrong, but it has a very sinister, you know, something lurking, you know. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, I think your, your senses are all correct on that. I, the song and the, and the name of the band is really about the hypocrisy of people and groups. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Um, they tend um, to be guilty of the very things that they claim to be against. And that's one of the things that really struck me about the past uh, four years, four or five years, um, are the number of people and groups who claim to have certain principles. Um, but as it turns out, they, they really don't, it's all conditional. So if it's something that uh, happens to favor them, they're perfectly fine throwing other people under the bus. And right. I found that to be extremely frustrating and extremely disappointing. And that's what uh, inspired that particular song. Yeah, I had, I had a slight feeling about that, but I wasn't 100% sure. But it just like that, it just had that a sinister backdrop to it, you know, and, and I can see how it, that's the, I think that's the one thing with music. I was someone was talking about, you know, a lot of the songs from 1971, you know, 50 years ago. How those songs, the way they were written, were about what was going on in the world, not 
how some of the songs of the of the artists you know the mainstream artists i should say today they're always it's all it was about me 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 you know they it's like the rest of it they don't really care what's going on in the rest of the world unless it pains to them but mostly their songs are about you know well you know almost like woe is me you know and it's like but there's so much going on out there in the world you're not the only one that's going you know having issues you know things are happening you know like you said in the past five years major things were happening you know um not to go too much into it that uh tv series that's out on hulu uh the hand hands made tale mm -hmm. a lot of that to me was scarier than a horror movie yeah yeah because uh, there's some reflection of that uh in what you see going on right and now. i was yeah you mentioned 1971 um Apple TV has a series uh, called 1971 on now. Yeah, I heard about that. Looking at it, and um, and they they really bring that up because a lot of times you listen to those pieces. Like I, I think they point out uh, a Marvin Gaye piece that to to someone who doesn't know what was going on at the time almost sounds like this happy, uplifting song, but it's really a a, a takedown of how uh, how people were being treated. Um, Although my, I, I will have, you know, since this is a prog show, um, they, they had to do the obligatory um, criticism of Prague um, because when you think about what was going on in Prague in 1971, there are a lot of great albums that came out then and they, they flashed yes up on the screen for a second and then talked about pompous music that nobody really wanted to listen to. It was about a, uh, a 15 second little blurb on it. Um, that reminded me why I don't particularly like Rolling Stone. Um, uh, they had a lot of their reporters uh, on this show and uh, they, they were never terribly favorable towards prog music. Uh, but uh, the show is interesting in, in what you, you pointed out that uh, that was a time when a lot of musicians were looking at what music can do to change people's attitudes and opinions. And here's right. where I get to my my very serious point, anyone who <laughs> might be listening, if you are a graphic artist, you are really letting me down. <laughs> I cannot tell you the number of songs that I've written, and Jeremy's written about our uh, situational stuff, and, and I have yet to see anything from graphic artists uh, that, that's depicting, you know, uh, uh, the, the events of the past four years, uh, some of which are major events that you could do huge murals over. Uh, right. But but I feel that uh, we're being let down. Come on, graphic artists, please give us an icon, some sort of visual icon that we can use to, to remind us of the truth of these times. Because Jeremy and I could write a thousand songs. They're all open to interpretation. You know, nobody's saying, this is specifically what we're talking about. So listen, because we don't dumb it down for people. Whereas if somebody would do some graphic representation of what actually is going on, that would be helpful. So oh, yeah. uh, please, you're please get gonna, You're going to probably hear from the graphic arts community. Very yeah. well. <laughs> Since I work with a yeah. lot of those folks, uh, I wish that uh, somebody would get on the freaking ball and do something about right. it. Yeah, it's like, you know, um, going back to, you know, the, you're saying how they basically they snub Prague. They always do that, and they do it with a smirk on their face, like, you know, I'm supposed to do this, you know, or, or something. And it's like, every, to me, every music that's come out has... A reason for it to be to exist, even if it's something someone made in back in the seventies in their garage that sound that sounds like it's recorded in a tin can, but it it captured that moment in time, you know. Um, and to to talk down on 
on a on a music uh, a genre that was pretty much has been influential in a lot of artists today, even even if whether they they'll admit to it or not. To put you know to put it down, it just kind of it's kind of like uh, you're I put kind of like you're out on a in a rowboat and you you know you I don't like this boat so I can poke a hole in it you know it's like well you're in the, that boat you know it's at least that how I can picture that is like you know don't snub a music form just because you don't like it or oh pompous I mean. Queen well, I think was pompous. Queen, Queen was pompous, you know, and they made a bunch of money. So, yeah, but they were they were theatrical. <laughs> I got right. a couple of two that, that I'm working on right now that are are very Queen esque, and it was theatrical. I think people uh, maybe this is uh, controversial. I don't know, but people uh, had problems with with Prague at the time because rock and roll is supposed to be every man's music. And uh, the, the technical abilities of the players uh, uh, may have turned some people off. These guys can't play rock and roll. They could play classical or, you know, what is this guy doing? It's supposed to be a four bar guitar solo. And all of a sudden uh, I'm in for a 16 bar jazz odyssey. What's going on? Uh, right. So I think that's where some of the, the uh, naysayers may have been coming from. And of course, as soon as somebody has in their head, I don't like Prague, it's very easy to be on that bandwagon because there's so many other people are on that bandwagon. Right. So, oh. so uh, being a big Prague fan uh, was never easy and it's still not easy. No. Well, I had a, I had a friend of mine years ago. Uh, he's a big he's a big metal fan and he was always, uh, when someone mentioned Chris Rock, oh, oh, that stuff sucks. And he he was really, um, had a lot of animosity to it, to the point he said something that was the stupidest thing I ever heard. He says, I wish that a plane that had Genesis on it was flying from the East Coast and a plane that had the Grateful Dead uh, on the west coast and they could fly and crash into each other and i'm like going really what's that all about and and then after he goes i hate prague um he had his cds in in his closet so i went in to go see what stuff he had and i pulled out marillion misplaced childhood and i'm and i put it right into his face i said so you hate prague right why is this in your collection? You know, you know, how do you say, you know, your argument is now invalid? <laughs> it's like, you know, so that's what I'm saying is people they'll they'll say they hate it, but I guarantee you probably find something in their in their collection, whether it's a physical collection or you know, digital collection that has a prog not a full prog, but a partial prog connection. So it's like, you know, they, I think they're doing it, like you're saying, to jump on a bandwagon. You know, it's all oh, the cool kids are saying it. So, you know, I'm going to say it too, you know. And they kind you of- You should go out and get yourself a copy of, of uh, Brian Woodbury's Old Time Prog. I don't know if I ever sent that to you, but uh, there's an artist I work with named Brian Woodbury. Uh -huh. And uh, he did a 14 or 15 minute epic prog tune that's hilarious. Uh, I will try to send it to you so you could hear it. Okay. But uh, uh, Jer Jeremy's heard it. Yeah, well, and he what, basically, what he basically, you know, when, when you love something, you're able to make fun of it in a way that's very different from when someone who hates it uh, ma ma makes comments on it. And it's clear that. Brian is a big Prague fan, but you know I think that most uh, Prague musicians and Prague fans uh, would would find uh, well-meaning humor uh, uh, helpful, as opposed to you know this TV show that just dismisses you know Prague music as basically being you know unimportant 
non-essential right. uh, music. Well, years ago, I mean, um, I'm trying to remember where I, um, what it was called, but it was from National Lampoon, and they did, um, they didn't call it prog, they call it art rock, but it, it was, it was prog. I mean, you heard all the different sections that were not offs to uh, bands at the time. I think it was, done, I want to say 1971, the same, the same year, you know, so everything, prog band that was out at that time, they, it, this song had a nod to it, and it, um, I think it was called the Art Rock Suite. Uh, I'll have to give that one. I'm gonna have to give that a listen because uh, it it was. I, I think I've seen it on YouTube uh, a few times years ago. I have. I don't remember if I ever downloaded it. Um. Oh, and Marcos, there's an excellent yes parody by Mike Keneally called "Faithful Acts." Oh yeah. Yeah, that's that's very right. funny. That is very funny. You know who other who also did a great, a fantastic Zappa uh, uh, tribute was uh, Weird Al Yankovic. Oh yeah, in it's a, a great song. Called, uh, Fr What's something about France? Uh, oh, Big in France. Yes. Oh my God! And I'm I'm a huge Zappa fan, and I know some of the Zappa people here in LA, uh, and uh, he did it justice. Uh, yeah, he really did. You know, it was funny, but it was on one hand, but it was very serious. Uh, the playing was serious playing. Yes. Good stuff. So, yeah. And that Mike Keneally song, Faithful Acts, is amazing. It's it's very short, as I recall. And they he quotes, I don't know, 30 different yes songs. And you really have to listen carefully to pick everything out. It's very Mike Keneally right. was supposed to play on a on a. a um, old time Prague, actually. Oh, okay. So Brian, Brian was. I don't know what the story was with that, but when I heard Mike Neely was doing it, I was like, "Yeah, this is perfect." Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll send it to you. It's, yeah, it's a it's, great piece. It's a great piece, and it's true to form. You know, when he does his gentle giant thing, he really think, does a gentle giant thing. I think you did send it to me. That's because it's not now. You're saying talking more about it. I think you did send it to me. When, okay. uh, when it first started talking um, about a, a month or so ago. I think I said it to Jeremy and some of his friends thought it was serious. It, it, isn't that like they didn't realize it was a parody? Right. Well, it's a great piece of music. You know, I, I think it is a parody, but it's also, I mean, you know, it's really well done. So I think that's that's the one thing with uh, a really good parody, you know, like that, you know, you have mask it with very well playing that you know you know, like you said it's it fooled people you know um but it's some, like, people don't, some people don't like that though just so you know <laughs> they don't like it when the artist is is makes them feel things and then all of a sudden they realize that the artist was trying to make them feel something completely opposite right. uh, people don't like to be to be fooled uh, but they are going to be, so get used to it. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a, that would be a great album <laughs> title. Well, I'm, I'm working on an album right now called What Did You Expect? Uh, that's got 13 tracks on it, but it's more pop oriented. Uh, they're, and they're all somewhat different from each other. Uh, but uh, I think people expected in the old days an album to have a uh, a unifying characteristic and also to be similar music we don't need to do that anymore there's no need for that if right. if because tracks could be bought as singles or you could buy the entire album if you so desire at cupboard brothers records <laughs> and uh uh you, you could be in for a track that you thought was going to be prog that turns out to be straight up rock or a track that you thought was going to be rock and it has a lot of prog elements. Uh, the freedom these days to be able to do what you want is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's what, you know, I have a lot of different styles of music in my collection. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of it recently have been, uh, it's based on uh, recommendations on Facebook. You know, people popping, you know, showing 
their favorite album and then they'll give a little blurb or maybe a, a link to YouTube to listen to it. And then of course here I go clicking on the link and then there's another band I gotta go investigate. And it get, you know, you just keep on going down that rabbit hole. That's the one thing with Facebook is just making that rabbit hole deeper and deeper, you know. And there's there's just so much out there, you know, old and new. And that's one of the things too is with your uh, Secret Martyrs Club that when I listen to it, it has a timeless feel to it. Like, it, you know, 15, 20 years from now, if I go to listen to it again, it's going to be, it's going to have, you know, a, 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 as if it was written at that time. You know, it's it just feels just the the music has just that feeling, and then of course the the lyrics, the writing in it, um, it goes back to I I want to say uh, where they you're talking not about you know not being of the the me the new me generation where. Uh, you know, it's like I complain about, you know, oh, I stubbed my toe, you know, oh my God, it's the end of the world, you know, that kind of um, lyrical uh, things that are going on with some of the music today. Uh, but with yours, it's like it's a deep, deeper meaning and deeper uh, subjects, you know, so, and I think no it's... it's well, thank you. Thank uh, the, you. The truth of the matter is that when you're young, you want to write songs about sex, drugs, rock and roll, and then sometimes you hit a point where you want to write a lot of songs about love, love gone bad, fantastic love, whatever it happens to be. I don't know, Jeremy, how you feel about it, but I'm way beyond any of that uh, <laughs> in, in what I want to write about. I want to write about things that that uh, affect the world, things that affect the nation, uh, larger, larger issues that just going on, you know, to me, because who, who right. really wants to hear about what's going on with me? They want to hear about something they could relate to. Yeah, right. no, I, I agree. Most of the stuff I write, as Dan mentioned, is instrumental. So when I'm inspired to do anything, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't really consider myself much of a lyricist either. So, but when I get inspired, it's because it's something important. So, um, you know that was definitely the reason why we we did that album, um, and you we're going to do I some think, more yeah. stuff too. Let's not a you know we got a lot more coming. As long as things go continue to go terribly, there, we can guarantee <laughs> that we are going to have something for you to listen something, to. Something to worry about. Yeah, we we have done a number of pieces, and they're definitely more coming. Um, I have a, a few instrumental albums out. I mentioned Iconic Sky with, uh, with John Beagley and Robin Shell and Tom Krause. Uh, that's definitely in the prog realm with vocals. Uh, I have a Chapman Stick album out called Train Tracks, which will be on the Cover Brothers page, but is now uh, on my own Bandcamp uh, and my own uh, website at jeremycovered.com. Um, and then a fusion album called Toward the Sky. Um, so all of that was very uh, cheap therapy during the past year um, to keep me out of trouble. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the one thing I, I noticed. There, there's, there was two types of uh, things that happened with musicians. Either they completely shut themselves down or they went into overdrive and, and started creating new things. Um, I spoke uh, a few days ago with uh, an artist uh, named Robert Berry. You know, he's worked with oh, Emerson. Yeah. With three. Um, three. And three. And, um, and he was saying during the pandemic, he learned how to do, you know, mixing and recording. So that, uh, so it's like, it was almost, and, and for myself, if the, you know, the pandemic never happened, I wouldn't have done anything like this. It's just I had a lot of time 
And I had a lot of friends that were musicians and I was like going, well, since they're home, I'm going to take a chance and ask if they want to do a show. And, you know, this is, this is show number 27. So I started it back in November, the day after uh, act November 4th. So I started it right then. And, um, but, you know, it's like everybody did something different or so maybe something new during the pandemic that they, that if it weren't for the pandemic, you know, you wouldn't have done. Right. And, and, and I think it's, you know, I, I don't say anything bad to the musicians that decided they didn't want to do anything. You know, that was their choice, but I, I applaud the ones that took advantage of that time and said, well, since we're not going out on tour, I'll work on some, you know, some Morris music and put out some albums, you know. I mean, I got, I know of one band uh, that they just put out uh, their first, uh, this year, they put out part one of their, of a two-part uh, CD this year, you know, so. It's like, you know, they're going to have like a lot of material for, you know, when they go play live next year, you know. Right. So. Well, we're not going to ever play live, just so you know. So <laughs> uh, the only way you could get the music is the recordings. I, you know, there's will be no secret Martyrs Club uh, world tour or even the local <laughs> tour of any kind. Well, well, just uh, that is true. Uh, although I do perform in the D.C. area, I just had a gig with my band Apothecary yesterday. Uh, it was it was uh, part of a festival. Uh, there weren't that many people there, but it was live stream. So it was all, all outdoors. Oh, that's uh, cool. And then uh, I do play solo Chapman Stick in the D.C. area as well. Um, so I have a few gigs lined up this summer. Um, for that, but very few people will likely see any of those. And um, we'll have to plan the Secret Martyrs Club tour for uh, for next year, once we want. <laughs> how, are we gonna, how are we gonna cover all those instruments, man? Uh, we'll just have to have a big Zappa, Zappa-sized band. Yeah, 20, 20 guys together. <laughs> Yeah, you know, well, you know, that's a, it's actually, you know, I don't, I want to go over on our time, but the interesting thing is that a lot of times when I'm producing a record, I'm keeping in mind what, how the hell are they going to pull it off on stage? How are we right. going to do this live? When, with Secret Martyrs Club, that was never a, uh, that was never a consideration at all. Right. You know, if I, if we wanted to have, three or four different keyboard parts going at the same time that could never be played live that was cool you know it, that, <laughs> so uh but on the some of the stuff i'm working on now i say it really needs another guitar part but there's another there's no way of it fitting in there so let's try to cram the guitar part into one part that could be played live uh that's a consideration you have to give when you have a, you know 192 tracks you could use but uh, but when you play live, you're not going to have that luxury. So you have to think in advance what kind of band you are and what kind of record are you doing. Uh, and if you're a band that's known for their live shows, don't go crazy with the overdubs because you're never going to be able to pull it off. That's right. Yeah, what I'll do too is um, this will be rebroadcasted over on my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com forward slash not. So, you know, I'll put all the links that you you just mentioned a little bit ago and I'll put them in the, the description section so everybody can go to your uh, to your guys' uh, pages. And well, yeah, well, we're not fully set up with uh, Cover Brothers Records yet. The, uh, the debut album, I guess, albums, might be at the end of the summer but just google jeremy or i and you'll one way or another you'll find something uh out there you know we we may i think i believe we made an error i believe you helped us correct the error ron 
Uh, oh, okay. Well, I... is, uh, putting our stuff wherever we happen to be at the time, wherever we felt would be the best place. We never really centralized our work, but thanks to you, uh, the day after you and I talked, we we started doing that. So oh, by the cool. end of the summer, it should all be live. Okay. Yeah. And um, but I'll, yeah, I'll and at least want, put the. I'll at least put the um, for Secret Martyrs Club, so at least they can get that. And then, I want you to be able to hear that Rush tune, though. That that's not a Rush tune. It is our Rush tribute song that Jeremy wrote because it's really freaking good. Uh, so Jeremy could give you the information on where that would be available to be listened. To. Yeah, I'll I'll send you the links, but it's um uh, on my Bandcamp page. If you go to Bandcamp and look up Jeremy cover, you'll pull up uh, actually all the songs that uh dan and i have done together um uh, other than the secret martyrs club um and then you could also get info at jeremycovered.com um and we will have the covered brothers records band camp site populated soon good good then everybody can go there and grab up grab up all your music hopefully thank you rod really appreciate it Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to to do the show. You know, I really appreciate that. I'm actually going to go call our, Jeremy and my mother right now for my weekly call and tell her that we were just doing this. So hopefully she'll be excited. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then uh, within, uh, within about the, the next hour, it should be up on uh, YouTube. You know, upload times vary. <laughs> weekly so i don't i just I want to think if i can since obviously people are listening and writing you messages and i don't see them i just want to thank mark so much for all he's done for us uh and you know it's been a really fantastic experience working for him working with him uh on these projects yeah i'll i would definitely second that and um also thank uh John Beagley and Robin Shell for all their contributions. Uh, and Marco Dino. Marco and I'm Dino. Out. Marco Dino, fabulous guitar player. Uh, he's helped us out too uh, on occasion and uh, monster player. Uh, so we're, we're blessed with that. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you guys again. I really do appreciate, you know, again, the time spent here with me and i look forward to uh more music from you guys down the line yeah and okay. i think uh ron will be doing this uh again with iconic sky yes yeah so that will yeah. be with, with robin and john and tom oh yeah you get to meet those folks i, I yeah. think i'll watch that one since i've never met either of them in person i think i'll, I'll watch it there you go well, then I'll, I'll be talking again. Well, I'll be talking to both of you guys again, you know, in various areas online. And um, and I'll just close off with a, another big thank you to you guys. And thank you for that music. That, that was really good music, um, very memorable. You know, it's just something that I, I go to a lot. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thanks. See you later, Jeremy. Take care. I'll see you okay. later. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.